Good morning. Welcome, everybody, to this book launch. Um, I'm still waiting a bit, as you can see, with my welcome, as there are still participants entering the room. So let's give it another half minute or so. Arrival of participants still on. Well, good morning. I would very much like to welcome you to this book launch, which is as digital as the current lockdown and need for social distancing demands. My name is Kirsten Maas Albert, and I'm heading the Africa department at the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. I'm joined by my colleague from the Brussels office as this book launch is co-organized uh, by us here in Berlin together with the Brussels office and later on my colleague Anna Schwarz will be speaking. Um, I should also say at the very beginning that you as participants will have the chance to pose questions at the Q&A uh, button. You can write, you, you click the bottom at the bottom of your screen, Q&A is written on it and write your questions or comments. We will make sure that we have a good half hour at the end um, to answer your questions. So today is about a book we issued in early December last year called Climate Justice and Migration, Mobility, Development and Displacement in the Global South. Climate Justice and Migration. Our starting point was a simple but important question. How should policymakers respond to the reality and future prospect of vast populations being displaced and relocated in an era of global heating? With climate change looming, anxiety over immigration from the global south is increasingly fueled by apocalyptic fears of ecological breakdowns. Rather than reproducing such anxieties, we understand ourselves as being part of this world that is increasingly shaped by climate instability and inequality. And we feel a growing need to search for the incorporation of justice within frameworks of environmental and migration governance. Our volume therefore offers fresh perspectives on the relationship between climate change and human migration questioning the pessimistic prisms of security and market-oriented approaches to adaptation that currently guide policy. As a digital book launch always allows for bigger international participation, we are extremely happy to welcome some of the authors of this volume and contributors who will be introduced by my co-editor and colleague Ali Ahmed a bit later. We are also very honored by the Zoom presence of two well-known politicians, namely Claudia Roth and Eric Marquardt, who are both effortlessly creating visions for a more humane and yet realistic migration policy. Let me introduce Vice President of the German Parliament and MOP of Alliance 90 The Greens, Claudia Roth, that has been encouraging and inspiring our attempt to bring diverse scholarly and activist knowledge and experience into the debate on climate change and migration. She has contributed a forward to this volume and I'm very pleased, Claudia, that you will open this book launch with a few remarks. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, dear Kirsten. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear colleagues, guests and friends, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today to talk about an issue that, despite its obvious urgency, has been ignored for far too long, the climate crisis and its implications for global justice and migration. So please, please read this very important book. I'm happy to make promotion for it. It's really important. We come together for this meeting in highly challenging times 
Our world is facing a horrible global pandemic that has already cost more than 2 million lives and is far from being over. However, even in this moment of unparalleled crisis, this is no time for a break. We cannot hit the pause button on the other main crisis of our times. On the contrary, the climate crisis is still a matter of life and death. As United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres put it two years, about two years ago. And he was not exaggerating. He was simply describing facts. He was describing the dramatic, the extreme nature of reality. And his words ring more true with every passing day. The climate crisis is the greatest threat confronting humanity today. It's devastating implications for peace and security, for human rights, for our health and ecological sustainability are already being felt across the planet. For millions of people, including millions of children, the climate crisis climate-induced migration and displacement are no longer a hypothetical issue. Whether they live in Bangladesh or Tuvalu, in Portugal or Sweden, in Sudan or Ethiopia, people all over the world are confronted with the destruction of their homes, of their cultures, of their livelihoods, for them, the climate crisis means desertification and crop failure, means soil salinity and water scarcity, means floods and deadly heat waves. And once again, as is so often the case, the worst impacts of the climate crisis are felt mainly by people in the global south. In other words, by the very people on this planet who, from a historical perspective, bear least responsibility for global warming. Therefore, the climate crisis is, above all, a crisis of global justice. Within the global south, in turn, it is the most vulnerable groups that suffer most, souls dependent on natural resources for their subsistence and livelihoods. Souls with the least ability to protect themselves or adapt. Women, children, indigenous people and other marginalized populations. As United Nations Relief Chief Mark Lukok pointed out, conflict, climate shocks and environmental degradation increasingly go hand in hand. They drive humanitarian need and where they occur together, they ramp up suffering and, and make it even worse. The world's least resilient countries are the most likely to experience political instability, economic collapse and social fragmentation. And they are also exceptionally vulnerable to environmental breakdown. As a result, the climate crisis acts as a multiplier of existing injustice, it amplifies conflicts and further undermines elementary human rights, such as the right to food, the right to water, to shelter, the right to education and health, the right to dignity and to life itself. Every year, 20 to 25 million people are displaced within their country due to extreme weather events. If we don't act now, the World Bank estimates that by 2050, there could be more than 140 million internal climate migrants across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. And on top of everything, the corona pandemic is exacerbating 
the situation even further and is turning into a poorly pandemic, a multifaceted crisis that threatens core development goals like equality and food security, but also but that also endangers key democratic principles and international cooperation as a whole. So the question is, what can we do? An important first step is to gather more data to support research on climate-induced displacement and thereby to close the gaps in our knowledge because otherwise just policy will be even more difficult to design than they are at present. Most importantly, it is a globally shared responsibility to drastically limit the harmful effects of human activity on the global climate and to respond to the unfolding humanitarian crisis that is resulting from it. It is time to treat the issue with the seriousness it demands and to make it a key priority for governments around the world. Conversations like the one you are having today, we are having, you are having today, are a very important first step on this road forward. Thank you all for joining us today. I look forward to an interesting and passionate debate. Unfortunately, I cannot be present all the time because we have a meeting of the Bureau of the Green Group in the German Parliament discussing also the climate crisis, but with my heart, I am with you. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ali Nabil Ahmed. Um, I was lucky enough to have uh, co-edited the book that we're discussing today um, with uh, Kirsten Mars Albert and her colleagues at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I'd like to begin, please, by uh, thanking Claudia Roth for those very, very inspiring words and for her support for this project, which dates back to uh, its earlier stages. Uh, and um, I'd urge you to take a look at her forward to the volume if you can. She very kindly wrote a forward to the volume as well, as Kirsten mentioned. So thank you very much, uh, Claudia Roth, for joining us today and getting proceedings starting but with those inspiring words. So um, I am I'm excited to be joined in this session, this sort of middle section of the session, um, we're, by three of the authors who, or, authors and voices who featured prominently in the volume. Um, and uh, their names briefly, I'll introduce them in more detail when they're about to speak. Their names uh, briefly are uh, Joyce Melkatan, uh, Dr. Christiana Froelich, and Dr. Avidan Kent. Uh, they will be uh, introduced in more detail, as I say, when they're about to speak. Uh, if I may, before uh, we get into that uh, moderated discussion, I will take a few moments uh, to uh, frame the discussion by telling you a bit about the book itself, the approach that was used within it, uh, and uh, the kinds of um, basic contents. I'll, I'll give you, show a few slides as well at some point, just to give you a taste uh, of what's inside uh, the, the, the covers of this book. Uh, then after I've done that, uh, after I've done the presentation, we've had the panel discussion, I'll be handing over to uh, Anna Schwartz of the uh, Heinrich Böll uh, office in, in Brussels, who'll be having a discussion uh, with Eric Marquette, uh, Green MEP, uh, and that after that, there'll be uh, a chance for a Q&A. So uh, don't wait uh, for the Q&A to, to write questions and comments. Please use the chat block box throughout. It'll be beneficial to uh, the moderators of the various discussions that we're gonna have. And uh, we do want an interactive session, so please do, do, do uh, write your questions and comments already in the box. So just very briefly on the approach that was used, um, as you can see, we want to inform policy debates. We've got Claudia Roth here, we've got Eric Marquand at, at speaking afterwards. So our kind of 
discussion with, you know, uh, with these experts is going to be sandwiched in between policymakers. We want to influence policy. Uh, at the same time, uh, we, did, did we, we wanted to get away from some of the uh, dominant ideas in policy circles right now when it comes to climate change and migration. And our belief was that actually some of these ideas are somewhat reductive. There's a tendency towards an environmental determinism uh, that uh, makes too many easy assumptions about a kind of cause and effect relationship between climate change and migration and, and leaves too many situations unstudied. Uh, which are relevant, to, should be relevant to this discussion. Very, very uh, sort of briefly, you can summarize the dominant approaches, I think, by uh, approaches that are too optimistic and too pessimistic. Um, there's a sort of pessimistic alarmism, which leads to that security minded focus, uh, whereby um, people start predicting anarchy and breakdown and conflict in a way that um, leads to a sort of fear of mass migration to Europe. And that is in a way an unhelpful way to frame this discussion. Uh, and uh, it tends to give a, a sort of emphasis to how should Europe protect its borders? Uh, how should Europe protect its resources? Uh, and actually has very little to say about how people who are gonna be affected by climate change, um, how, you know, how they can receive adequate protections uh, and uh, it tends to um, narrow the focus to a sort of European perspective without regard for, for how majority humanity is going to be affected by uh, uh, global heating. So not that kind of alarmism, I think, is a bit unhelpful, that pessimism, uh, as I would say is a certain optimism that you get in some circles where people talk about adaptation and talk about resilience. So those are you know, not inherently bad ideas at all. There's very positive things about uh, thinking about you know, how migration uh, can actually be part of the solution. And that's what some of these approaches are trying to do. But often I find that um, people who call for adaptation or espouse adaptation, which is a term that's crept into policy documents as well, uh, tend to put the responsibility on the people who are affected without regard for who's gonna be affected worse in what ways. Um, and it's in a way, it's a sort of abdication, abdication of responsibility uh, by saying, look, you should be resilient. Um, and, and you know, for all the benefits of uh, embracing an approach that doesn't think migration is inherently bad, it doesn't do much to address uh, the situation of people who lose everything as a consequence of, of, of uh, climate disasters and so on. So uh, a climate justice approach, which is the one we have uh, adopted in this volume, which is somewhat different uh, to both of those approaches, uh, is one that looks at um, how climate change will affect and intersect with existing problems uh, in the way that we run our world. Uh, and those are a range of political and economic problems um, that are involved in the causation, the causality, and the consequences of, of, uh, of, of, of climate change induced uh, movement. That means the way that we organize our um, food system, that means different kinds of development, agricultural development, uh, growth led development, infrastructure led development, extractive development, uh, and of course in urban situations, urban in cities, urban development, uh, and how these things in our world that already displace people in quite large numbers, um, how are they gonna be exacerbated uh, by climate change uh, or global heating rather? And then who, uh, and to think about consequences, who's affected worse than how, and who is able to adapt in what ways? And migration then is just one way of adapting. Uh, not everybody can migrate. So uh, hence our usage in the title of the book of the term mobility, which is a, a broader concept one that doesn't just look at migration as one type of movement from A to B, rather <clears throat> it's, a, it's a way of thinking about who is able to migrate and why, and if somebody is not able to migrate, that's also relevant to our discussion. So um, a mobility perspective then is moving away from the idea of migration and sedentariness as either sort of problems or you know, solutions to this issue, uh, rather they are, um, you know, the real question is how are people empowered to make their decisions to migrate or to stay put if they don't want to migrate? 
uh, and um, and that I think is a, mi a migration, uh, um, a climate justice and mobility justice perspective, and, and that's rather different I think from those dominant approaches we mentioned earlier. Let me just show you briefly, if I may, a couple of slides before I move on to the moderated discussion. Okay. Are we having a technical problem? Okay. No, you can do that. Ah, Paul Okay, I hope you can see that now. Um, apologies for that. Um, that's our front cover. And uh, that image there is a, a photograph taken by Ditsan Billy, who is one of the people who feature in the pages of an interview by, conducted by a journalist called Natalie Sauer. Uh, and that is um, somehow an image that we thought, Kirsten in particular actually thought that was a, Kind of interesting image uh, because of its sort of symbolism of you know of uprootedness. That's a tree in uh, you know on the coast of a Caribbean island um, that's being um, uprooted due to coastal erosion. And these are some of the other activists uh, and uh, thinkers and experts who feature in that particular conversation uh, by uh, the journalist Natalie. And uh, there's another one a separate conversation between Anna Naomi D'Souza, who's a journalist who's interviewed Erlida Dominguez at the bottom right of your screen. She's a young indigenous leader uh, from Brazil. Um, and she uh, is talking about uh, how she views climate change and the climate crisis. Um, and then uh, we have, um, yeah, we have uh, Ditsa and Billy there at the bottom left. Joyce Malkatan will be uh, joining us later. And, uh, Oladasu um, is the uh, Aden, Adenike is the ambassador for Fridays for Future in in, uh, uh, in Nigeria. So we have a range of voices. Uh, you know that one of the things we're trying to do is broaden the scope of people who are participating in policy discussions uh, and give them platform to speak and exchange ideas uh, and get away from some of the more um, not cliches, but some of the more the, the limited ways in which this topic is discussed. Small island states is uh, a big focus, right? Uh, you know, the island of Kiribati, it's a big focus of this, uh, you know, uh, climate sort of anxieties, climate migration anxieties. And rightly so, these Pacific islands that are gonna disappear underwater are, uh, are something we do cover in the book. They're an important aspect of the story. Here's an image of, of uh, the island from the island of Palau, uh, which is, uh, we have a story on that in, in the volume. Uh, probably the first of its kind, a uh, sort of detailed report on that, um, and actually has some surprising, uh, surprising information comes out of that about why people migrate, why they don't migrate. Um, but nonetheless, we want to move away from an approach that just looks at those kind of poster children for climate change. Um, we have uh, pieces, this is a piece by Paolo Gaibizzi, it's his photo as well, of somebody uh, called Musa, who's an agriculturalist, in Gambia, and he's actually looking at uh, why people, uh, how migration and staying put are actually related to each other in a rather complex way. So he's looking at a part of Africa that's been affected by the European, recent European attempts to tackle root causes through development, through trying to get people to stay put, um, you know, by developing agriculture in Africa. Uh, and Paolo's giving a, a very interesting take on that and kind of problematizing uh, the European policy agenda there in ways we don't have detail to discuss, but basically trying to say, look, it's a bit more complicated than that. It's not gonna work by just throwing money at development and that's not, you know, and people are gonna stay there. It doesn't work like that. All the information we have is that people don't necessarily stay somewhere just because there's agricultural development. Agriculture and migration are related uh, in ways that are complicated. We also have a piece by Hashim bin Rashid on, um, this is um, a, a, an image that's uh, taken from Via Campesina's uh, um, website. Uh, this peasant organization, transnational peasant movement, 
Via Campesina, who has a actually don't figure, I think, as prominently enough uh, as they should do in debates about climate change. They're talking about people who want to stay put, who don't necessarily want to migrate. And they don't really figure at all in discussions about climate refugees. These are people who might be displaced internally um, by uh, weather related, uh, extreme weather related events. But, you know, what him, Hashim is saying in this piece that he writes is actually there are all sorts of other reasons why these people are, are being displaced uh, related to the models of economic development that we've been pursuing for decades. So maybe actually climate change, uh, addressing that and climate change and migration can be a way to finally address uh, development induced displacement, um, uh, urbanization and things that really have uh, you know, unplanned urbanization, expulsions really from the rural world, things we haven't taken into a consideration properly and look at why people who may want to stay put need to be addressed by different sorts of policies, food sovereignty agenda, land reform, agroecology, those kinds of things. Image from Karachi. So we have a range of topics. We also have a situation here where people are moving into situations of climate harm, of, of climate vulnerability. So it's not just about people moving away from situations of climate vulnerability. And here we have uh, two scholars, Noshin Anwar and Malini Sur, providing a really uh, rich insight into the South Asian experience of uh, climate uh, struggles for climate justice and the sorts of things they want to be taking into account. Policymakers should be taking into account already um, worrying levels of heating, dust and pollution, the kinds of development models, property construction driven uh, in cities uh, that are, are going to be exacerbated by climate change for people who are moving into areas of climate vulnerability. Very briefly, Arne Harms is a scholar at Leipzig University. Uh, he's provided a really interesting case study uh, from the Bengal Delta about people who are um, displaced, you could call it, but very, very, very slowly over a period of several years to the extent that they may even one year move, each year just move a little bit further along uh, on, their own, on their own land. Um, so um, to uh, be shifted, uh, shifted along on their own proper land, so uh, by coastal erosion. So, um, and they're not actually covered by uh, NGOs that are dealing with people displaced by disaster. So, you know, who's looking after these people? Their land is actually, in some ways, they're affected worse than people affected by disasters because they're, you know, you can't go move back. What land is lost, it's lost to coastal erosion. It's lost permanently. So uh, <clears throat> that's the kind of... Um, experience that is not really taken into account uh, by some of these dominant approaches at the moment. Finally, we have um, a, a sort of image here from uh, Tristan Taylor's uh, research with uh, Delmay Kupidu. Uh, he's taken this, uh, these images uh, from uh, a part of South Africa, a rural part of South Africa, um, where drought has actually led to, uh, not led to migration. So you've had agrarian distress, but people are not migrating elsewhere. They're actually staying put. They're not able to migrate elsewhere. They don't have the resources to migrate elsewhere and they're receiving uh, state benefits. So in a way there's a situation of dependency that's been created. And he's looking at how people have been displaced in the place that they live, if that makes sense. Um, the term that academics use these days, I think, is in place displacement. And that's something very interesting, I think, to think about people like that, communities like that who are affected in this way. They need to be uh, brought into this discussion. Um, so, uh, yeah, and this is Celia McMichael's diagram. She's done a piece on health policy. Uh, and this just shows you, um, you're looking at those. We would like to look at people in both of those boxes, people moving into areas of climate risk. Uh, as well as people who move away from areas of climate risk. And currently the discussion is too narrow. Okay, um, let me get to this moderated discussion. Okay, uh, stop share, I think, yeah. And wonderful, that seems to have yeah, worked. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, in, uh, in reverse order of how I'll bring them into the conversation. First of all, let me uh, introduce Joyce Melka Tan, please. She's uh, a lawyer at uh, Client Earth's Asia Climate and Energy Initiative. She writes for uh, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. It's a reporting service uh, on uh, United Nations environment and development negotiations. It documents global efforts to tackle climate change, biodiversity loss, sustainable land use, and other 
global challenges. She's from the Philippines, uh, but she's currently based in London and she'll be speaking in her personal capacity. Secondly, we have Dr. Christiana Frölich, who's a research fellow at the German uh, Institute for Global and Area Studies in Hamburg, Germany. Her work focuses on forced human mobility in the context of political and environmental crisis and on the interlinkages between environmental crisis and violent conflict. She's conducted field work in Palestine, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, and her work has been published in various academic journals, um, political geography uh, and uh, international political sociology, are just two examples. Uh, thirdly, we have uh, Dr. Avedan Kent, who's an associate professor of international law. Avedan is the founder and convener of UAE's uh, international law research group and is the editor of uh, the International Law at UEA blog. He's written and edited a bunch of books and articles on climate-induced migration and uh, works on various related subjects, public participation, environmental law, and uh, international uh, courts. Um, I'm gonna begin with Avidan, if I may. Avidan, are you there? Uh, hi. Yeah. Um, so if I may, I'd ask you to speak, uh, each of my speakers, uh, these, these three speakers, to begin with a sort of opening statement, uh, and I'll put the question to each of them differently. Avedan, perhaps your contribution to the volume is about um, the issue of climate refugees and how existing legal provisions don't really, or do to some extent, but you know, don't really provide for them, for their protection. Uh, could you tell us a little bit, you know, what there is now in terms of a protection for people affected by climate change uh, and um, how would you address gaps if such gaps exist? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Ali. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Ali, for inviting me for this very uh, exciting event. So there are, of course, many international laws that are relevant to climate-induced migration, and there are a lot of gaps also in the legal framework that are relevant at least to some communities in some okay. circumstances. So um, let's start with uh, the gaps. Let's speak about the pieces that are still missing in international law. So as I see it, so let me give you the bottom line of these uh, five to six minutes. So as I see the missing gaps are, the missing pieces are um, first with respect to the right to cross a border to enter another state. This is indeed required in some circumstances and I will speak about this in a few seconds. And secondly, there are also gaps when it comes to protecting the most basic rights of migrants. So here there are some gaps in terms of enforcement and also in terms of resources, because of course we need resources for protecting certain rights. We'll go back to this issue as well in a few seconds. And lastly, in the specific context of sinking nation islands, which Ali mentioned before, there is also one big unknown with respect to statehood, which I will not speak about today because I simply don't have the time. So let's park this one aside. Now, these are the main gaps, and those of you who are hoping to find some answers to these gaps in the main treaties that are governing the situation of climate migrants, like the Refugee Convention or the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention. So I can already tell you that there is not much there. The Refugee Convention doesn't even recognize these people as refugees. And while some efforts are being made within the climate change regime, at least to date, there is simply nothing there in substance, nothing of substance over there, there are not, nothing in terms of legal rights and obligations within the UNFCCC about the rights of climate migrants. But let's start this discussion with a, a more positive tone. Instead of speaking about what we don't have, let's say a few words about what kind of, of laws, I'm sorry, we actually do have. So first and possibly most importantly, there are of course human rights laws. So of course, when people must move, as uh, Claudia Roth mentioned before, uh, when they need to move because of climate change, then many of the human rights are possibly violated, starting from the most important rights, like for example, the right to life, the right to shelter, the right to be treated without discrimination, and all the way to rights like cultural rights, for example. So your own right to practice your own religion and to speak your own language. 
So here, of course, there is a huge body of law that is already in place and at least in theory should provide at least some protection in the context of climate induced migration, including, for example, the core human rights treaties or soft law instruments, soft law, soft law documents, like, for example, the United Nations guidelines for internally displaced persons, which some states adopted as binding rules. Now, these human rights are important in two scenarios. So first, there is the context of internal migration. So those will be able to migrate internally without crossing a border. So these individuals should, in principle, be protected by international law. International law is imposing a requirement to protect their human rights. Now, whether in practice these people are being protected or not, this is, of course, a much bigger problem. This problem is related to a much wider question of respect for human rights, which I'm not going to get into um, right now, today. But it is also related for another matter, which is, in fact, very much relevant for today's discussion, the matter of resources. So in essence, protecting certain human rights, like the right to shelter, or the right to education, or the right to health, and all these rights are, of course, very much related to the context of climate-induced migration. So protecting all these rights requires resources. And where should these resources come from? So here is one reason as for why I insist on the term climate refugees, because the word climate is pointing at a certain direction. It is establishing that some are responsible for this, for this uh, situation and that those that are indeed responsible will also bear the cost. Now, the second context that is relevant for this discussion is the context of cross-border migration. And here, most will tell you that the big problem with human rights laws is that they don't give you the right to cross a border and to enter another state. And this right to cross a border and to enter another state is, of course, very important in some cases. Think, for example, about the case of uh, sinking island nations where the possibility of internal migration is somewhat limited. So here, about a year ago, an international human rights tribunal, the Human Rights Committee, recognized, and this, as you may know, was celebrated very, very loudly all over the world. They recognized that indeed the right to life can mean that states will have to accept you. They can't send you back to your island if, again, your island is uh, more or less sinking or flooded, depending on your perspective. Now, this decision was certainly important, but on the other hand, I don't think that this decision is perfect. I don't think that it created a new category of climate refugees, as some organizations uh, perhaps understood this decision to mean. I think that there are some very significant problems with this decision. And here, first of all, we need to remember that despite all the celebration about this decision, the claim in this very specific case was, in fact, rejected. And we need to pay attention to why it was rejected. It was rejected based on two grounds, which are very, very relevant to understand. So first of all, it was rejected because the risk to life in these cases must be unique for the claimant and must not be a result of general conditions. And of course, in the context of climate change, this is never going to be the case. The risk from climate change will never be individual in nature. It will always be a risk for a group, a risk for a community, or a risk for a nation, perhaps. So this is the first reason why I have some doubts about this decision, about the importance of this decision. The second reason that this case was rejected is that the risk to lives must be imminent. And in this case, the threat to Kiribati, the nation that they were dealing with, despite the very difficult life conditions that are already existing over there, the threat to Kiribati was not regarded as imminent, which make you wonder what will be regarded as imminent and at what point these people um, will be able to migrate from this island. The people, they already know that the situation is very unlikely to improve. So why drag them on? Why force them to stay there until the very last second when, when all hope is uh, basically lost? To me, this sounds a little bit cruel. So to conclude my, uh, my answer, as you can see, we do have some laws that are protecting in practice climate migrants, but we also have certain gaps. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Avidan. Thanks very much for that. Um, it's been um, uh, pointed out to me that it might work better if I leave my camera on, so I might do that for the rest of this uh, discussion. Um, we'll come back, uh, Avidan, to uh, you shortly um, and, and sort of try and tease out a little bit more uh, of what you're saying about what can be done for, this, for climate refugees and uh, perhaps give you an opportunity to respond to some of the critiques of, uh, of your perspective. Um, which, uh, you know, in some ways the book itself contains implicit, uh, not critiques I'd say, but they offer a different perspective to yours uh, somewhat, um, disciplinary and uh, otherwise. Uh, speaking of which, I'd like to invite Christiana to join uh, the discussion, please, at this point. Uh, I felt, uh, Christiana, your, uh, hi, I felt your, dis your paper was uh, a nice kind of contrast to Avidan's. Um, and I was wondering if, uh, you know, to give you your moment to speak about it, I'd invite you to offer that, uh, to sort of explain how your approach is somewhat different uh, in dealing with uh, it to a legal perspective and how your climate justice, mobility justice approach um, sort of, maybe not a critique, but offers a, a sort of contrast to that legal perspective. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ali. Thank you for uh, the kind introduction and also for the invitation to this event. I'm really looking forward to the discussion um, already. So as you said, I approach the topic at hand um, from a slightly different angle than Avidan just did. Um, this is simply, I think, due to our different disciplinary backgrounds. Now, the starting point for my work is that today, um, as there has been a lot of new research happening in the last five to 10 years, we have a better understanding than ever of the social phenomena associated with climate change, especially with regard to climate related human mobility. Now, we know that climate change mostly engenders south-south movements, um, it mostly engenders internal displacement within the global south and immobility, and by the way, with this, it's basically debunking the ongoing secretization of the so-called climate migration within the global north, where the idea is still that if people are displaced by climate change, most of them will, uh, will come to the global north. Now, importantly, what's also developing or has been developing is a growing awareness that climate change effects play out differently for already marginalized groups, as for instance, compared to political elites. Now, from my point of view, this raises important questions of climate justice as well as mobility justice. The concept of mobility justice uh, basically means or uh, tries to conceptualize that access to mobility is experienced unequally along intersectional categories like gender, race, religion, age, or socioeconomic status. And the concept of climate justice highlights the fact that that has already been mentioned actually in the very beginning of this event, that while climate change is caused mainly by industrialized states, developing states bear the brunt of its impacts without usually adequate compensation. Now, these dynamics play out globally, as I think all of us know, but for me, it always helps to zoom into one region or even one specific state. And since the Mashlik is what I know best, this is where I'm taking you now. So like many world regions, the Mashlik has been suffering from a rising average temperature, changing precipitation patterns, sea level rise, and more severe and frequent extreme weather events like heat waves, droughts, and also floods. This impacts water supply, crop production, health, economic growth. And importantly, this is different from the climatic changes that the peoples of the region have been adjusting to for centuries. Now, importantly, being confronted with these challenges highlights regional governments relative ability and willingness to adapt or to mitigate climate change impacts. So if we arguably somewhat problematically take the classic Westphalian state as a model, we have to say that the institutional environment in the region tends to be difficult. There's often a disconnect between elites and normal population, and there are pre-existing and often protracted conflicts. Crucially, climate change also highlights that a state's respective position in the international system, and this is 
really particularly important for the discussion that we're going to have. Specifically, North-South relations influences a state's cap capability to react as it hinges on economic power, which is often less developed in former colonies than it is in former colonizing states. So it is crucial to look at environmental change and responses to environmental change, not as separate from, but as integral to politics, both on the domestic level and the international level. Also, uh, both national and international climate change policies can result in second order effects of climate change that I still think are not talked about enough, which are often neither recognized nor are that transparent, for instance, when the nationalization of natural resources affects the control of or access to resources and livelihoods for parts of a population or society. We too often stop on the national level and don't zoom in to the micro level. Now, problematically, of course, power relations on the ground and local indigenous knowledge are often not considered, rarely considered, I really have to say, and in the worst case, this can further weaken already marginalized and vulnerable populations. Now, what do these reflections about climate justice mean for climate-related mobility? First of all, as you have mentioned before, Ali, mobility is one of many, many possible responses to climate change. It can be seen as a way of adapting, but it can also be seen actually as a failure of adapt, adapting. So uh, if everything else has failed, the last resort is migration. So it's really a matter of interpretation here. Um, this is migration or mobility in response to environmental change is by no means a new phenomenon. And importantly, it is not available to, ev to everyone. So it's really important that we ask who can move and who cannot in a given context. Now, very quickly, analytically, it's necessary to differentiate between slow onset events or fast onset events when we talk about climate change impacts. And we have to differentiate between different kinds of mobility that result from these kinds of events. They can be, they can range from voluntary to involuntary, from short to long term. So it's a very complex field that we're talking about. Also, and this is something that um, sometimes gets a little bit lost when we talk about climate related mobility, is that migration and human movement is influenced by economic and sociopolitical factors uh, on the meso and macro levels, on the national and international levels, um, as much as it is influenced by individual, individual positionality on the micro level. So, the socioeconomic and political characteristics of an individual, of a household, or of a community that is exposed to climatic events. So individual wealth, gender, age, health, pre-existing migration networks, etc., play a key role, but they are not sort of separate from the uh, overall context. Um, it, as my last point, whether and how state or non-state actors in a given country address climate change impacts also influences migration decision making and I think we'll be coming back to that um, later as well so I think it becomes clear that there are aspects of climate and mobility justice that are not commonly taken into sufficient account by legal or technical strategies but are nonetheless crucial if the goal is to address climate change in a sustainable and an effective way thank you Thank you, Christiana. Thanks very much. Uh, that's a perfect uh, moment, I think, to bring Joyce in. Hi, Joyce. Um, so uh, just to, to dive straight in, um, I think a good deal of what Christiana was saying just there resonated uh, to me with the discussion that you have in the book uh, with uh, the journalist Natalie Sauer and, and the other activists, um, particularly in terms of um, what your experience of what you've witnessed in, in the Philippines, uh, how that plays out on the ground and how the kinds of policies that are needed, the policy areas that are not really very responsive where they should be in terms of going beyond the sort of security perspective. So um, I was wondering if at this point you could perhaps tell us a little bit about, uh, yeah, talk to that, talk to uh, your experience uh, what you've witnessed in the Philippines and, and how on the ground and at policy level, um, 
how should that how should policy be more responsive to uh, to climate climate justice issues yeah sure thank you so much ali for having me here and this is indeed a very interesting and very important discussion and before i answer that question i just want to set out the stage about the discussion that i had with natalie regarding experiences in the Philippines, because it links really nicely with what Christian mentioned earlier about these inequalities and how they make a difference in whether or not a person can move and where that person can move. And I would like to start uh, by giving an example of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. And for this moment, setting aside the issue of whether it was made or three times more likely by climate change or more, more intense by climate change, I think it gives a good example of a kind of extreme weather event that is predicted to be more likely to happen in the coming decades and how that impacts people on the ground. So for example, in, in Typhoon Haiyan, uh, what Christiane said in her chapter that rapid onset events tend to lead to temporary um, displacements or movement that occurs over short distances. We saw that happening here really. And the, the different factors of gender, livelihood, education, and wealth really played a role in this. So for example, uh, the basic question was whether people could in fact move. And we saw how these different dimensions affected that because the poorer people who had no resources and less capacity to move had nowhere to go. And so they were stuck in ev evacuation centers, which uh, were themselves flooded also and became disaster zones as well. The second was that they had, they were then cut off from their livelihoods and so could not in the short term have any means of income and were th therefore reliant on dole outs and aid, which took time to get to the ground because of infrastructure problems that were caused by Typhoon Haiyan. The next one was on health and education, where the, the poor people who were rendered involuntarily immobile, meaning stuck in these evacuation centers, uh, did not have good access to basic health services. And uh, in many cases, things like gender-based requirements for, for example, uh, mothers who had to breastfeed their children were not given the appropriate resources and areas within the evacuation centers to do so. And you can trust this uh, very starkly with the rich who in themselves were experiencing a lot of trauma caused by this typhoon, which was at that time, the strongest ever to make landfall in the world. Uh, and that uh, record has now been broken twice. Uh, but uh, within the, the richer neighborhoods, they had a better ability to move. First, they could move uh, higher within their houses, uh, which were also of stronger material, materials. Second, they had social networks, not only within their communities, but also in other parts of the country that they could move to. When they were in need of health services, they could more easily access helicopter services to take them to hospitals in other areas of the country. And their children, even if the schools were not operating immediately after the typhoon could still find other ways of learning as we are experiencing right now. So there is a very big uh, intersectionality factor in terms of mobility justice and how that has impacted this microcosm of a community within the eastern seaboard of the Philippines. And so for me that brings us to a lot of policy necessities that need to be addressed. So yes, we do need laws that, that allow the rights of displaced peoples to be protected. So not just right to life, but also right to livelihood, education, health, family, privacy, and all of these things. But uh, just to link it back to Christian's point that this is not just a legal problem, but it is a problem that calls us to look into our models of development and growth and how these are meant to respond to the people that are in the last mile and the people that need to be given more agency and more capacity, which are the people at the most vulnerable uh, sites of, of 
uh, coastal communities, for example, and the, the people at the forefront of all of these impacts. And this is just one example of a rapid onset event. And as you pointed out in your introduction earlier, when slow onset events are considered, it's even more difficult to pin down climate change or mobility justice as a big factor that needs to be taken into consideration. And that's because they can move just a few feet or a little more inland every year. And it's always a multi-causal uh, decision whether one moves or not and where one moves, whether it's within your borders or from one country to another. So I think that this uh, hopefully lays out a lot of uh, good starting points for discussion. Thanks very much, Joyce. Uh, we'll be coming back to you shortly after a, 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 another round uh, with the other speakers. Uh, Christiana, if I might bring you in at this point, uh, we've got sort of 15 minutes or so for a discussion. So I'd like to, you know, we'll um, try and restrict our answers for sort of three to four minutes each. Um, but basically, um, what I want to do is, is introduce an element of argument debate here at this point. So, um, Christiana, your field in particular, um, we've, uh, so there you are. Um, your field in particular um, is one I've, where I've heard a lot of talk about climate refugees and um, climate change being a major factor in shaping the future of politics, right? The Arab Spring, I've heard, even saw some pieces, um, some, uh, so, some instances where people were saying the Syrian war is down to drought and can be explained by that. Um, do you find that, uh, how do you respond to that? In some ways, is it encouraging to know that people are finally taking notice of climate change or do you see problems with that sort of discussion? Bearing in mind your interest in the complexity of, of climate change. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the Syrian, the Syrian idea or the idea of a climate related drought that led to migration and that was um, happening very shortly before the outbreak of the Syrian version of the Arab Spring um, has become very, very prominent. Um, so the idea of one climate change related drought being a sort of untold pre-story of an ongoing conflict um, has gotten a lot, of, a lot of traction. At the core of this discussion is really the question of um, which kind of causal connection do we infer in, in these um, phenomena. Do we think it's a direct connection? Is it uh, meaning that climate change is made directly responsible for one social or political outcome, in this case, migration and then migrants protesting? That was the, uh, that's the usual idea. Um, the problem with this is that if we infer direct causality, we need to be aware that we risk securitization um, resulting potentially, as you have mentioned earlier, in walling off policies and then the criminalization of migrants. So a very sort of migration negative approach. And we risk giving responsible governments um, or the, the governments governing actors in such, an, uh, such a setting, the opportunity to greenwash their policies and to um, sort of let go of their responsibility to address this effect in the sense of, and this, is, this has actually happened in Syria, where government actors have said, this drought is not of our doing, it's a result of climate change, so we can't do anything about it. Um, and sort of taking this as an excuse not to address uh, the results of the drought. Um, I'm personally very, very critical of uh, these kinds of, or of easily making these kinds of direct connections, because usually from my research, and um, I've been doing this for so long now, uh, it's, it's much, much more complicated than this. It's already difficult to tie one particular drought doubtlessly to climate change, especially in a region that has experienced droughts for centuries. Um, this doesn't, by the way, this doesn't mean at all that I'm trying to downplay the effects of climate change. What I'm concerned with is the, the political um, instrumentalization of an argument like this. 
for instance, for more sort of walling off policies um, in the global north. So I'm more in favor of um, an understanding that of indirect causalities or of climate change as a risk multiplier, as was mentioned uh, earlier, with both basically stressing the role of governing actors for addressing climate change impacts in a way that is inclusive, sustainable and effective, because that's the resp responsibility of governing actors. So in such an understanding, it's not environmental change or climate change that causes uh, mobilization in a population, but the unwillingness or the inability of a government to address climate change impacts. So from my point of view, in the particular case that you mentioned in Syria, the inaction of the government of Bashar al-Assad became one of the many reasons that people took to the streets in 2011 and not the drought in itself. And I think this is an important connect, this is an important distinction because um, as I mentioned, the political sort of, the uh, reasoning behind the two causalities is very, very different. Thank you, Christiana, thanks very much. I think that's a good point uh, at which to bring Avidan back into the discussion. Uh, Avidan, um, your, um, you know, your, your sort of call for more protection for climate refugees is, um, you know, does it come as far as you're concerned with risks or uh, do you, as it were, uh, are you sensitive at, at some level to the concerns of those who say, look, actually it's a more complicated problem. If we start creating specific laws for people affected by climate change, well then how do you define climate change, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then of course it's open to instrumentalization, climate reductionism. How do you respond to all that? Um, yeah, um, I kind of agreeing with you here. I think it's not always easy to distinguish between the causes for migration and indeed in almost all types of movements, it will always be difficult to point at one single cause for, for movement, war refugees, for example. It's almost never just about the war. It's always about the context and many other reasons for the movement. And here we will have to look very carefully at the science. We need to see what science is telling us about every specific case study. And I certainly agree with Christian that in the past certain, uh, um, in certain cases, uh, perhaps a very eager academics were too fast to label certain movements as climate migration, where this was not really the case. But at the same time, I think that we need also to remember that in some cases, at least, the link between climate change and migration is actually very, very clear. The link between climate change, even if not the only cause, but as a major and leading cause for migration is very clear. And think, for example, about the obvious case of Pacific Islanders and think about certain coastal communities. And here science is already telling us that there is a link. I mean, climate change is clearly affecting their availability to to water, to jobs, to to food, to um, to to land, and all these problems. Science is already telling us that the link is there; that they are created by climate change. So we need to pay attention to the very specific context and the very specific community that we are speaking about. Now, I want to make two more observations uh, about my uh, defense, uh, if you want, about the word climate in this context. So first of all, um, as a lawyer, it's very important to use climate, I think, in terms of liability. So we all know that the states in which climate migration is happening are not those who are responsible for this phenomenon, but we also know that at the same time, these countries will have to bear the burden of resources, as, as Joyce mentioned before, that you need resources in order to deal with, uh, with these kind of circumstances. So here I think that it's very much useful to speak about climate because the term climate is implying a relatively clear liability and responsibility by certain states. And this link, this pointing finger is entirely disappearing when we are opting for the more diluted terms that many are preferring, like disaster displacement. Because um, who is responsible for the case of disaster? Who should you, as lawyers, who should you sue? God, I mean, it's, it's, it's much more uh, neutral in this respect and much less uh, helpful or useful in my view. And the last point that I want to make here is a bit more pragmatic. 
Now, you are asking me about the usefulness of the term climate, uh, climate refugees. I know that also about the term refugees, there are many questions, but we're sticking here with the climate element. So I will ask right back about the usefulness of deleting the term climate from this phenomenon. And I want to remind you here that for many, many year, years, this uh, phenomenon did not have an institutional home until in 2010, the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention, took this phenomenon on board. And 10 years later, this is the main, not the only, but the main institution in which this topic is being addressed and in which this topic is being discussed. And if you will take away the climate, then why should the UNFCCC will bother with this topic anymore? Wouldn't this result be, uh, I don't know, uh, not very constructive and perhaps very convenient for certain states also? So I don't think that this is an outcome that we will all be very happy with. Thanks very much, Avidan. Uh, that's brilliant. I'm, I'm uh, inclined to bring Joyce in at this point, and this will probably be the final um, uh, um, intervention uh, before we hand over uh, to Anna Schwartz at Brussels. Um, and I think um, what I'd ask Joyce to do, if I may, um, I'm wondering how you feel about this. Uh, do you feel able to resolve this really? To me, it's a really interesting dialectical tension between those who are calling for more law to specifically uh, protect people affected by climate uh, change, by global heating, and those who say who are more cautious. Um, and I'm, I, I actually have a lot of sympathy for both sides of this argument, actually. Um, I kind of want to have my cake and eat it. Um, if, that sounded like Boris Johnson, forget that. Um, basically, um, yeah, to get back to the point, perhaps you could help us resolve um, this tension and how uh, at the policy level in practice, actually it's never a really such a sort of dichotomous uh, thing where you have to choose one or the other. And then uh, after you've uh, spoken, I think we can hand over to uh, Anna and we're more or less on time. So feel free to answer at your uh, pace. Great. Thanks, Ali. And I share the same sympathies with you that I do believe that there are important uh, considerations that we can draw from both arguments, right? And these discussions have been going on for many years by many scholars. And so I don't know that I'd be able to resolve <laughs> this question. But uh, my insight would be that there is space for both approaches to provide their own contributions to the question of how we can better protect the right of people who are affected by the question of injustices in relation to climate and migration. And for me, I, the, the role of law and treaties and all of these strict legal definitions and terms and what obligations they mean for receiving states is that, um, all of these discussions can make the legal implications very clear, which means that the governments would then know exactly what they are meant to do and, and within what timelines. But then the questions about intersectionality and all of the different factors that are considered, which is uh, the, the things that Christiane has raised, I think that these play a huge role in the background laying all of the discussions that will then be translated into the hard legal terms that will unleash obligations. And there's a huge role for that. And that's an ongoing discussion as events unfold and more and more crises uh, are happening because we then begin to identify more and more the different dimensions of these impacts. So on gender, on livelihoods, on socio, other socioeconomic factors, on the networks that people have. I think one thing that for example, is less, uh, maybe maybe less efficiently discussed is even the language barriers that people that are, that, that are having to move because of displacement will have to deal with as they acclimatize within a different community. So, and this can happen within one country or across borders. So I think all of these different dimensions play into the policy discussions and it's very important to to have all of them sufficiently laid on the table so that 
we know just the enormity of the crisis that we are facing and we have more and more people from dif different disciplines inputting into the process so that when the laws are formed and the legal terminologies are put in place they are able to address the basic problem of climate and, mig uh, and migrant justice and i would just like to bring back to one of the statements that I saw in, in your introduction, which I thought was very, very powerful. And that's uh, your statement that right now it is the migrant who must adapt and not the system that has displaced that migrant. And I think that at the bottom of this, everything that we are trying to answer, whether from a legal perspective or from another discipline, discipline's perspective is really to turn that around so that we can find ways that our mechanisms and our systems are slowly modified so that they work for the migrants. And what we envision looking at is a place where people are not uh, in a place where they are forced to move, but any sort of migration and mobility is voluntary. And when they do make a, a decision to move, their rights are not uh, harmed or threatened by that decision. Wonderful, thank you very much. Thank you very much all three of you, my speakers, uh, for this uh, section. Um, uh, and I think we're around about on target. Uh, do please stay a uh, part of the discussion and there'll be a Q&A and there may well be questions directed to you um, uh, at the end of the Q&A. So please do, if you can, stay on uh, as part of the discussion. And I think we're more or less on target to hand over to Anna Schwartz, uh, Schwartz uh, of the Heinrich Boll office in uh, Brussels. Anna? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. Um, yeah, my name is Anna Schwarz. Um, I'm heading the program for global transformation in the Heinrich Böll Foundation's office in Brussels. And um, before I introduce our next speaker, I wanted to invite uh, the audience again to really raise questions in the Q&A box um, down <laughs> in the bar of your uh, Zoom screen. So, um, there will be enough, uh, enough time to, to discuss some of your questions and, and we're very much looking forward to that. And now it's my um, great pl pleasure to introduce uh, Eric Marquardt. Eric is a member of the European Parliament and the spokesperson of the, Green, the German Greens in the European Parliament on asylum and migration policies. Um, he's a member both of the Committee on Civil uh, Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs and the Committee on Development and also a member of the EP delegation for relations with Afghanistan. And before Eric um, engaged in politics, he um, was working as a photojournalist, actually um, documenting the situation of refugees, uh, for example, on the Balkan route, but also in Greece um, and in Afghanistan. And he organized many expositions and presentations to illustrate the uh, situation of refugees and to promote greater understanding for their situation um, and their needs. And um, that's why we are really, really happy that Eric today joins this event and discussion to give us insights into policies and initiatives on the European level, tackling the interlinkage between climate justice and migration. And with this, being said, um, please, Eric, the floor is yours. Um, very important topic. Unfortunately, it's easier to present what is missing um, from a European perspective, also from a national or international perspective, than what we already achieved. Um, I think I will keep my intervention also as a reaction to the things which were already said rather short. Um, but I think um, maybe it's important to mention some uh, thoughts. Um, uh, I will start with uh, one thing which discussion here, but I think it's missing in the discussion in general, that if we talk about climate displacement or how we call it, uh, climate, whatever, and um, we are not, in general, like sometimes having the feeling be talking about something which is far away from us, like Pacific Islands, for example, but actually it's 
it's actually our responsibility because we and the responsibility actually for Eric, sorry, there seems to be a problem with your mic. So now I changed the microphone. Yeah, now it's better. It's better? Sorry, thank you. Mm, did you hear nothing or oh, We heard that um, it's our responsibility. Yeah, it's our responsibility. That was the truth. Okay, um, yeah, that it's our responsibility that people are forced um, to flee, actually, that people are leaving um, their homes and are forced to leave their homes. So I think the um, main point which is missing in the political discussion at the mo moment is um, that we are the people causing um, the people um, like that they have to flee. Um, and although the European Parliament has a kind of long tradition of talking about um, climate induced displacement, already 10 years ago, there was an um, European Parliament Research Service EPS study um, on, um, on protection issues. There's rather like no progress. So at the moment we have, an, for example, an initiative report on the impacts of climate change on vulnerable populations in developing countries, it's called. And um, it's a draft report at the moment. So we will vote it in the committee in the next weeks. And, and it calls for some kind of recognition of persons displaced due to climate change, but it's an initiative report. So it's not a law which leads to something. and. And if, if you look on the EU level initiatives, there is like nothing, um, despite there are possibilities to do something. For example, you can um, in include climate displaced persons into the qualification regulation, and you can um, connect the discussion um, in the European Union to the global compact for safe, orderly and regular migration. So it's the global migration compact. Um, it, where climate change is somehow mentioned um, as a driver for displacement, but also this is a problem for some member states, for example, in the discussion of the um, NDICI, so the new European Union instrument um, for de development aid, and some member states um, prevented uh, the global compact um, to mention there in the discussion. Um, I think in general, 2015 has changed a lot. Um, um, I can talk like hours about the reasons, but um, it has changed a lot on the discussion, um, especially on the discussion where you have a distinction between people fleeing from war and persecution and people fleeing from poverty. And in the end, if we talk about climate induced displacement, and um, we, uh, as we know, are not talking about um, climate refugees or whatever, but um, about people who, for example, lose their land um, uh, due to climate change. And if they lose their land, they're not like a climate refugees in the end, but they are poor. They have no land anymore. That's a situation they have. Um, but when we say in the European Union that poverty is no reason to flee to somewhere and uh, it's no reason to um, leave a country, we will also have no answers on um, climate induced displacement in the end. And I think that's a um, big problem, actually. And it's also a problem which affects the development aid discussion in the European Union, because many people know that um, poverty um, is a big problem, leads to conflicts, and that poverty is also the consequence of climate change. But um, poverty addiction is an objective of development policy, but it's not um, it's, it's kind of under attack at the moment that we kind of reach our main objective of development policy and the link um, from migration to poverty um, has come into the discussion. So there's huge pressure on just changing the narrative of development aid to a narrative where people are not even like um, able to flee um, where, um, yeah, you have a connection between migration and development policy. And that's a big problem because in the end, 
we have a situation at the moment um, where we know that poverty leads to a situation where people are not able to build up resilience, um, but where people are also not able um, to migrate. But if the development politics is kind of um, dedicated to poverty reduction, although the European Union has no interest in migration at all, I think that we will have a big problem to erase poverty and to create resilience um, uh, in uh, affected countries because um, people are just not, um, yeah, pe people, how do I say it? Okay, let's um, say it like this. Um, I think that the interest of the European Union at the moment is more that people are not able to leave their homes than to erase poverty, which may be lead to a situation where people can migrate. So um, poverty eradication is not even uh, the main objective of um, the development aid at the moment. So although we had some success, for example, in the NDICI, where the spending targets, for example, 30% uh, on climate change related issues and 10% dedicated to biodiversity, we have to fight um, that in the end, it also has some consequences and not only um, like, like nice, um, some nice projects which don't lead to um, a better situation. So I cannot present um, like very much what we did in the European Union at the moment and I'm not the European Commission and I'm also unfortunately not the majority in the European Parliament, but I think um, that uh, one main point um, we have to tackle is um, also in the rhetoric, the distinction between economic migrants and uh, the, like the real refugees, because of course um, there is more um, which lead to vulnerability than um, just war or conflict or persecution. Um, concrete steps to be taken and then we can go to the Q&A and maybe I can also answer a little bit more precise on some um, concrete questions. I think um, we have to take care that the NDICI spending targets um, make a difference in the end. I think that's one um, of the things um, we have to ensure and where we can really make a difference because as well, um, was already mentioned that it's not um, like a, situation where all the people will flee to the European Union, but um, mainly people are um, interna internally displaced persons in the end, um, if they have to leave their homes. Um, I think that we also have to introduce more um, criteria to prioritize persons um, who are vulnerable due to climate change for labor migration opportunities. So um, make it easier for people to migrate um, as labor migrants. And I think that it could be also a possibility to um, apply the principle of non refoulement also for persons um, who are like yeah, facing um, also um, consequences like being harmed of, uh, by climate change. And that, that could be also a possibility that you cannot um, uh, anymore like um, return people to places where they have no perspective. And I think in general, um, the main point is that we have to make Europe uh, feel kind of responsible for the consequences of its own behavior. Um, I think that's the main point I mentioned in the beginning that um, is missing at the moment. Uh, we are not feeling responsible um, for climate change enough, so we will not tackle the consequences um, enough. That's the situation, so yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erik. Um, before I hand over to Kirsten and Ali again for the q and I might have one little question to you again. Um, because you mentioned that uh, you're not the you're not the you're not the majority in the European Parliament, <laughs> but maybe you can uh, let us know a little bit also how discussions between the European Parliament and the European Council, for instance, are different because in migration policies, they are often not in line in their positions. Yes, so 
like uh, what makes it also a little bit uh, difficult to um, kind of react to the discussion which was said is that the reality not only and um, not mainly in the European Parliament but in the political discussion in the European Union is that it's very hard at the moment to create an atmosphere of discussion where we can talk about the reality when it comes to migration so we don't have a situation where the Geneva Convention, for example, or our laws lead to a situation where like people fleeing from war or persecution are respected. So if we don't have a situation um, where the people who are covered by international law um, are not recognized as people are covered by international law, and um, then it's also very hard to imagine that we don't, we will create an archi where um, climate displacement is somehow um, covered with the consequence that um, yeah you you have the problem covered somehow. So I don't know if it was um, really understandable, but the first point um, I wanted to say is um, we have a big problem even with. Um, people who are covered by international law at the moment, so not the problem with the people, but with the law governance, <laughs> and when it comes to the council, with um, European member states um, led by people who are rather lying about the reality, um, pushing people back um, to countries where they are, um, like in Libya, um, yeah, just um, suffering, um, and I think in this kind of discussion, um, it's important that, for example, when it comes to your question, the U European Parliament is mentioning the problem, trying to tackle the problem, but we invite, uh, for example, the Greek um, Minister of Migration and some other ministers and the Croatian government um, trying to talk with them about fundamental rights, and they are just lying all the time. That's uh, unfortunately the situation. And in this situation where you have maybe a majority in the council, which is not like linked to reality somehow, or like trying to lie about um, fundamental rights violations. Um, we have the big problem that we will not tackle the reality in the end. And um, of course the European parliament is more progressive than the majority of the council at the moment. But I think um, in a situation where we have actually not even one member state uh, trying to um, feel responsible um, for migration related issues when it comes to climate change um, where like no member state feeling responsible for um, like refugees in general um, it will be very hard to yeah to, to tackle the problem in general so i think the main discussion um, on how to deal with migration in the 21st century, on how to deal with refugees and people are forced to like forced displacement. Um, it is like it's, it's just for me like very hard to imagine um, how we like from the European Parliament um, with the majorities we have at the moment can tackle the, the problem in general. So I think the first step uh, would like be very like it would be very necessary to at least create a system um, which covers um, the people who are covered at the law in the laws at the moment. Um, I don't know if it was understandable what I said, but I uh, yeah, like uh, we have to do some homework. That's a, that's hopefully not the last sentence for today, <laughs> but um, I want to hand over to Kirsten and Ali now for the Q&A and want to thank you, Eric, for the very interesting input and insight. Thank you very much, Anna, and, and uh, especially Eric. Um, there was one, there's plenty of questions in all directions, and I've been trying to to uh, follow some of them, trying to possibly cluster them as more might appear. Um, maybe to start with just a comment on uh, the way we use language, Marta commented that we should rather speak about impoverished people 
instead of poor people, as she says, uh, uh, impoverished people live on land, which is often resource rich, but still remain impoverished, etc. So this is about language. There was a direct question back to Eric, uh, which I understand in the following way. Um, whether or not we should, uh, rather than saying the global north is responsible for um, CO2 emissions, therefore for the climate change effects that the global south is most targeted with, whether we should move to a more geopolitical perspective, which would uh, try to address the issues um, in a way that repositions the global th south on top of the hierarchy. Um, Maybe Eric, you can uh, comment on, on this perspective. It's even more ambitious than just doing the homework, I, I think. Yeah, that's correct. So in general, like also a topic where we can talk hours about it because it's not only a situation where we have to talk about CO2 emissions or, or whatever, but where we have a long history um, of exploiting regions of the world um, with our colonialism, for example, like 500 years of um, tradition, which uh, let's speak the truth, um, lead to a situation where it's very hard um, for the global south to build up resilience um, because um, we did not let them <laughs> um, build up the wealth um, which would be responsible to build up resilience. So. Um, yeah, that's um, and also from a like geopolitical point of view. Yeah, yeah, I, I can just uh, reply with a yes. It uh, would be good. There was questions about finance, particularly. Um, one participant from Rwanda is asking um, us whether there is enough financial support to especially IDPs as uh, uh, the person thinks that most um, climate change induced migration is actually happening within the country. Um, but it's often countries that lack the financial resources to address their needs. So this particular focus on IDPs and then um, I think some uh, comments, questions, were responding to what Joyce earlier said, uh, we, we should move away from thinking that the migrant has to adapt to, we have to change mechanisms. So <laughs> the question remains, how do we change the mechanisms? And then particularly to Avidan, there is the more uh, precise question whether the Paris Agreement offers sufficient options, means, regulations for addressing climate change uh, and climate justice issues, um, and in particular, the challenge of climate migration. For example, Article 6, um, how do you access the progress that has been made towards proper instruments and actual implementations? So I would for some time maybe remain with the mechanisms. There was also maybe related to this in a way, the question about the global compact on migration. Is that a, a, a document? which of course, as we know, is not a non-binding uh, obligation to tackle the issues of coping uh, with the effects. And then I cluster another couple of questions later. So maybe um, to, the, to the panel, to Avidan, Joyce, and Christiane. Avidan, would you like to come in first? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Um, about the Paris Agreement, um, it's a start. They started the task force on uh, migration, on climate-induced migration. This task force is basically a group of uh, very um, knowledgeable people from different intergovernmental organizations, from the International Organization of Migration, from the UNHCR, from the UNFCCC, all sorts of uh, international governmental organizations that are basically gathering together in order to come up with recommendations on what to do next. So it's a long way to go because they just issued the report, I think, uh, two years ago, I think it was, and the report was very useful and it was also adopted, which is uh, showing some progress because states are now showing much more uh, willingness to deal 
with the topic, which is very, very useful and very, very um, uh, productive, but the report is itself is, is very, very modest in its recommendation. It's very much the, the beginning of the way. A lot about gathering information, thinking about financial instruments, and so on and so forth. So the Paris Agreement was the, the first step toward addressing the issue. Um, mentioning Article 6 to the Paris Agreement. So this is actually really interesting because first of all, Article 6, we don't really know what it will look like because a sustainable development mechanism or whatever will come out of it is still under negotiations. Now, very interestingly, it will probably include some elements that are very much uh, looking very much alike the CDM that we already have under Kyoto. So some sort of an investment mechanism that will encourage investment in the global south in climate related investment. So this is on on the face of it doesn't look very much related, but when we dig into the details, we see that it is related because many of those investments, think about new dams, for example, they are resulting with migration, with displacement. So a lot of these new mechanisms, they include also social and environmental uh, procedures, social environmental guidelines. And these guidelines are in fact addressing the possibility of migration. They are addressing the possibility of predicting the social impact of these projects. So there are some baby steps if you want towards uh, the resolution of the problem, but still miles ahead from actually uh, something concrete and useful. Thanks, Avidan. Joyce, um, for you as an activist also, does the global pact give some hope? Uh, do you relate actively in your advocacy work? Is there other mechanisms you ask for? I do not actually relate to the Global Pact for Migration in my daily work, but I do see some hope for it. Firstly, because even if it is a, a non-binding instrument at the moment, we do understand that there are very strong political signals. And primarily, we start with a recognition from the international community that there is this category of persons whose rights are threatened or violated because of climate change impacts. And that is a very important starting point from which other discussions can then be had over what to do to respond to these rights and who would have the obligations to put in the measures to be able to address uh, these uh, threats of rights violations. And uh, just specifically uh, relating to that comment about the change of systems, so for the international bit, which is that there should be this recognition of a category of persons that are uh, threatened by, by uh, climate change. Uh, that's something that, that Avedan has treated very, very well and very descriptively in his chapter. So I will focus on uh, a little bit more on the aspect within borders. And some of the measures that have been taken in the Philippines, for example, are in four parts. So really to be able to come up with holistic approaches that states can do within their borders. So the first one is to focus on prevention and mitigation so that even before any hazard occurs, a community will have the resources that it needs to be able to preemptively respond. Uh, and then also pre uh, preparedness so that uh, within the first 72 hours, which is a crucial window where often a zone that is struck by a hazard would be left to fend for itself and should not be dependent on others to be able to come in and help the people whose lives and properties have been affected, uh, that they have the resources to be able to to do that. And then the third one is in the immediate aftermath of the disaster that the other national level organizations can be quick to come in and, and respond to a particular event. And then the last one has a longer term outlook, which is rehabilitation of affected communities, which could include two aspects. So one commenter had said that it would be important for people to be able to stay where they are because migration is just one response and rehabilitation uh, approach does uh, cater to this. And then the second one is uh, for damage that does occur. There are, There is a more resilient infrastructure that is then built for any future events. And so we hear a lot of people saying build back better and that's something that is very important to have. And so I think these are, these are things that are, that are 
approaches that are already being considered at the national level to address some rights violations of people who have been affected by climate impacts and whose decision to migrate or move from where they are or not would hopefully be cushioned and not be something that is involuntary. Thank you, Joyce. I, I would bring in one more question, which is related uh, in a way to, to what you illustrated. Um, uh, Jonas is asking us, in the absence of political momentum regarding an internationally binding protection regime for a climate-related status, should advocacy initiatives rather focus on regional instruments, which might also be more participative and locally adapted mechanisms, uh, I'm quite sure I could bring in Christiana on this uh, in the Middle East uh, region. Do you, do you see that regional mechanisms could um, bring some new impetus um, in a rather lame um, campaign for more support? Or uh, if you don't want to answer, I go back to Joyce and, and Avidan and also Ali possibly for this. Just very quickly, I'm not I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that because it's it's quite removed from uh, my day to day to today work. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention though, uh, regarding the last round of answers, um, is that I would like to raise awareness for the process of labeling and what it means for the people who are being labeled. This is um, sort of subfield in forced migration research. And while I'm, I'm completely on board with what Avidan said about um, liability and therefore including climate as a term in climate migrants or climate refugees, um, I would just always uh, advocate, if I can do that as a researcher at all, uh, for including the voices of the migrants themselves, because from my experience and from the interviews that I've done, a lot of people don't want to be called climate refugees or refugees for that matter, because it entails uh, changes in their lived reality that they are not prepared to, um, to confront or that they want to have agency over. So this is just something that, that I think we need to reflect a little bit more upon, because again, it's the global north doing the labeling largely, um, and the voices from the affected areas are not necessarily heard to the extent that they, that they should be heard. So sorry about the question about um, regional initiatives in the Middle East, uh, but I'm not in a position to really uh, answer that, but that's the point that I wanted to make. Absolutely, fair enough. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Christiana. I, I think what you what you last said is also um, reflected by a comment uh, from a participant from the southern uh, from southern Africa who said people know uh, how to how to cope. So people have knowledge to bring in uh, the the affected people impoverished have knowledge to bring into the debates, and we have to open channels for that. Um, maybe to remain with this uh, regional instruments, Avidan Joyce, would you like to, to, to answer? Avidan is nodding, so I, I give you the floor first. Uh, I'm happy to defer to Joyce. <laughs> I'm happy to take it also, as you want. Maybe first, then Joyce. <laughs> sure, I can come very quickly so that Avidan can also address it. So from the point of view of the Philippines, yes, there are regional initiatives, specifically at the ASEAN level, so the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There are various initiatives related to coordinated responses among the 10 nations, um, basically around the four approaches that I mentioned before. So whenever there's a, a hazard that's occurring in one particular country, then other countries can quickly come in via a system where uh, one country will say that they do need these things for them to be able to properly respond to the affected communities and the other countries can come in and cooperate where uh, they are able to. And I think this is uh, very important. Just one thing I suppose to I wanted to highlight is that it's not a 
given that when a hazard like a typhoon occurs, that it will automatically result in disaster or displacement or forced migration, because it is a combination of different factors, right? You have the hazard, but you also have the lack of coping capacity, you have the lack of resources and resilience that will then lead to a disaster. So at the regional level, at the ASEAN, at least there have been these discussions ongoing so that we don't need to wait for a global response for us to be able to, to address these very important issues. And turn it over to Avedan now. Yeah, I completely agree with Joyce. And this is happening not only in Asia, it's happening all over the world. And um, I think states are not very happy with the, the way the global community is attacking this problem, and rightfully so. And you see, for example, the African Union is now submitting a, a joint reply to the Global Compact on Migration. And in the reply, in their reply plan, they are addressing also climate change. And all other developments that we see today, they are mostly regional. You see the expansion of the definition of the term refugee, which I uh, Christian, we will have a full event just on this term at, on, on another day. Um, this is happening in Latin America, again in the Afri African Union. And also, it's very important that it will happen on the regional level because this is where migrants will end up in. We mentioned before, most of them will be internally displaced. Those that will not be internally displaced are unlikely to reach to the United States. They are more likely to reach to neighbor states. So um, I think that this is extremely important point to make. At the same time, I think that going only down this route is too easy for the, for the global north. Because if we are leaving it to the African Union or to Asia or to other areas to solve this issue, then what role do we have in this whole matter? So I think the ideal solution, of course, will be global. But given that global is not going to happen anytime soon, I think that um, the global north states from the global north must not leave it only for the regional and must maybe link up with the regional initiatives that are already taking place and offer some support. Um, I'd like to follow up with a question that goes back to what's been said uh, early on in, in, our, in our event. Uh, that there's this dominant uh, rhetorics about, not only rhetorics, but the, the dominant uh, way of looking at the issue through a lens of um, the effects, secularization, even militarization. So Clemence is asking us uh, how to move away from this. Um, and, and here maybe it's, it's also a reflection on, as you're saying, Avidan, this, this even different language to be spoken with which is interest driven there's different interests articulated and it seems that that north and south is not even in, even listening enough to the difference in language um, so how to move away from this securitization back to reflecting on root causes how can we bridge how can we go away from a dominant discourse um, to, uh, to one that, that really looks at what, what is happening on the ground. Who would come in with an idea to that question? I can start with a few words <laughs> because I, yeah, as I tried to mention before, I think um, to fight for Enforcing international law in general is one point. So, um, as you rightly said, um, the Global Compact for Migration is a non binding instrument and stuff, but um, actually, that sounds disappointing. But um, also, European law and the Geneva Convention are non binding at the moment. So, what we see in reality is that also, if we have binding law, member states of the European Union, and if they do, I think others also do. Um, not caring about the international law and just doing what they want. So even if you have a like binding um, global compact for migration, and um, that will not lead to a difference um, if there is no political will. So enforcing the laws we have is, I think, also the first step. And um, when it comes to kind of um, enforcing um, political will to not only talk about the fear of migration and securitization and um, making, um, that's the second point, um, development aid uh, a tool 
which just prevent people from fleeing the persecution or whatever, um, but which is also when we talk about development aid, uh, for example, um, I know it's not the, like the only or the best tool in the world to uh, tackle problems, but when we talk about that, um, the main objective is poverty eradication, and we have to defend the main objectives of the tool which we have. Otherwise, um, they are just used to um, yeah fight for political interest of the leader in the European Union, which are not the interests of the um, affected people of climate change. Um, and I think that's um, yeah, two points. Um, so, yeah. Maybe then I connect with uh, what, what Avidan uh, told us in his, uh, in his introductory um, remarks to what you're saying now, Eric, uh, on international law. Avidan pointed out that there is some gaps. So is it the role of policymakers, together with with uh, legal uh, advisors, of course, to to fill these gaps. There is a couple of initiatives, such as the one of, of Claudia Roth, and we will get to party politics with the last question in a bit. So, is is there gaps to be filled, and or is it uh, is it not not the right time to even open this, as I call it, Pandora box? Question for me? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry. <laughs> and to have it done, um, yeah. on <laughs> No, uh, like in general, it's a like year where we celebrate the 70th anniversary of the Refugee Convention, 2021. And um, yeah, it's, it's a great document, but um, not the best time for celebration at the moment. So I think if we compare things are written down in the refugee convention, for example, to the rhetoric we have at the moment um, in the political discussion and also the expressed will what should happen, for example, in the new pact for migration of the European Commission, where we did not talk about so much, but there is like climate issues are not mentioned there at all. Um, then I think the feeling is right that it's not good to touch this document at the moment because it will not lead um, to a document which is better in the end. Um, I think it's also a problem, as I mentioned before, that if there is no political will um, to stick to international law, um, international law also do not apply in reality. Um, that's also kind of uh, think a learning we have to just uh, keep in mind for our discussions and, and, and uh, so for like um, ideas on how to tackle uh, problems at the moment but maybe Avi Dan can also say a few words on that because like I'm uh, <laughs> sounds a little bit disappointing what I have to say and maybe uh, Abhi, Abhi Dan can um, Say some positive words. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the positive guy, if that's why you brought me over here. But I can only agree with Eric that uh, when you don't have political will, then all the laws in the world will, will not be very useful. Um, having said all of that, I think that the devil is really in the details. So here there are two things that uh, policymakers can possibly think about in, in, the, in the short term. Uh, of course, uh, much wider change is necessary, but much more uh, on the shorter term. So first of all, we have the Nansen uh, Protection Agenda, which is a very useful uh, document and is including a lot of very practical recommendations on things like visas, on things like uh, uh, very technical rules and regulations, border regulations that might be useful for, for, for these cases. And these are very technical and practical things that can actually happen. Secondly, we said before, uh, I mentioned it, I think Joyce made this point much better than I did. There is the issue of human rights not being enforced and it's not always because there is no political will. It's also because there is no political will. And this is of course very sad and not much that uh, maybe we can influence at this point. Surely there is something that we can do, but maybe not much. But a lot of it is because of the lack of resources. So again, um, open your wallets. This is a this is one, I think, conclusion that can imp improve things. It's not a very popular conclusion. It's not a very uh, popular thing to say, I think, but uh, that's one way to, uh, to address this matter. I was thinking, apart from what you're saying, Avidan, uh, very concrete, and, and thank you for the example. I think there, 
there must be very concrete measures uh, that can be thought of and, and implemented, even, even given uh, the, the international lack of political will to touch the, the, the broader problems. And I think we have to work on this, um, bridging academia, uh, activists and, and, and uh, poli po policymakers as, as we're trying today. Um, then finances, many questions have been uh, about this. You, you clearly say we need to bring about more financial support to the countries most affected. And some, uh, somebody in the Q&A also mentioned that the, the, the far bigger numbers of refugees end up in, in uh, the, the, the least developed and less developed countries uh, if, if we use these categories. Um, a third um, aspect might be um, maybe in empowering governance. I mean, the finance should also be there to not only um, help in a humanitarian way, but to empower governments uh, dealing with uh, big numbers of uh, environmentally induced uh, migrant, uh, migrants uh, to, to cope with the situation and to create sustainable solutions. Um, I want to go back to uh, the, the um, political question and, and just read out a question that is directed to the German Green Party. Now, Claudia Roth is not with us anymore, but I think it's an interesting question to just mention at the end of our discussion. If the Green Party will play a significant role in the new German government from September 22 one onwards, and I add, as we all hope, what would you recommend the party to push for or aim for in the area of climate justice and climate induced migration? And since Claudia is not here uh, with us, um, I, I thought I, I put this question out to the other panelists. I mean, what would you say should the German party, uh, the Green Party, uh, look at first if they play a bigger role in the German government? If anybody has this imagination, please, please come up and uh, help us out on this question. Eric, maybe uh, then for the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's like, okay, we have three minutes. So I try to make it short. When it comes to migration, I think um, it just makes sense um, to be in a government uh, migration-wise uh, or migration politics-wise to tackle the narrative for how we talk about migration at the moment. So if migration is recognized as a threat in the society, um, we will not have the possibility to create solutions. But if we um, try to shift it to a reality which uh, existed in the past, will exist in the future, where we have to manage migration somehow um, and um, make it in a good way as a success story, um, then I think some like easier solutions will come up to um, to deal with the topic, and that's one point. Um, when it uh, comes to climate justice, um, yeah, we have to talk about um, liability, but also one of many points. But uh, the point I mentioned before: um, stick to the principles um, of our external action that we want to. Um, fight against poverty. <laughs> um, because at the moment, I did not mention it well before, but at the moment there is a big fight because poverty eradiction, as we know, like less poor people can migrate more. There's a big fight that maybe our actions do not tackle poverty in the end because maybe it leads to migration. And I think the German government in the future with the green participation should not really see this as a threat, but just as a responsibility to use the possibilities we have um, to eradicate poverty and to be also proud of the possibility to help people in need and uh, create solutions also for uh, climate justice in the end. Um, but yeah, it's uh, many other things to mention, but I, I yeah, I'm sure the others will mention yes. some things. There's many other issues we opened up. Uh, also, our our uh, panel opened up. Uh, I'm sure we'll have more chances uh, to debate. I thought this was a this was a beautiful uh, notion to end this uh, discussion today. Uh, look at migration from a totally different perspective, seeing the potentials, um, 
challenges uh, and not so much the threats only. That's, uh, that's a big task, not only for the Green Party, but for all of us. Um, I would like to, to close here. Um, thank you very much uh, for all of your participation. Participants from, uh, this is so great about digital events in English from all over the world, as we noted uh, with, uh, with, uh, with some of them. Very happy to have been hosting this. Thank you very much, um, Ali Nobel Ahmed, for, for co-hosting and Anna Schwarz. Thanks, Avidan, Joyce, and Christiane for joining us from far and near, and uh, Eric and Claudia also for your daring contributions. I hope that this uh, made participants curious. You can order the publication. I have to do this promotion bit at the end. You can order it uh, for free as a print uh, volume. Um, you, find, uh, you find the way on our website, www.bölboell.de. So you find that documentation to download. Um, the link was also in the invitation to this event, but you can also order not only one copy, but many if you want to give it away also uh, or work with us. Um, yeah, feel free to do so. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, stay safe and sound and motivated uh, to fight for less poverty, less hunger in the world and more justice. Thank you very much.